everybody. Welcome to the Model Dynamics, Physics, and Air Quality Parallel Section 3. We have six speakers today. Um, um, I will repeat some reminder. First, if you are not presenting, please uh, mute yourself and turn off the camera. And uh, I will remain the presenter at the six minutes into your presentation. And also, send, please send your question in the Slack channel. OK, Mike, you uh, please go ahead. OK, uh, can you hear me OK? All right, well, thanks for attending my talk today, where I'll be describing the rat per orographic drag parameterization and its implementation in the FE3 Oops, FE3 GFS. I'd like to thank my collaborators from GSL who worked on this project with me. Subgrid orographic drag parameterizations are designed to represent the effects of unresolved topography on the mean flow, mainly through the effects of the vertical propagation and breaking of gravity waves in the free atmosphere and above. The GSL drag seat will soon be operational in the latest version of the wrap her. So these drag parameterizations have been typically used in coarse horizontal grid, grid spacings in the past on the order of 100 kilometers, but we're seeing benefits at uh, the wrap and her grid spacing of 10 kilometers and even down to three kilometers with the her. So we've uh, implemented the suite in the FE3 GFS, both global and regional, uh, via the CCPP. <clears throat> GSL orographic drag suite parameters parameterizes four types of physical processes dealing with the interaction between the mean flow and subgrid topographic features. We divide these into two groups. On the left, we have uh, large scale horizontal scale processes greater than about five kilometers, which are low level flow blocking, low level flow can um, impinge on uh, low level mountains and be um, blocked or um, go around the, the mountain, but uh, the mean flow is uh, uh, as a drag imparted on it in the process. And also as flow go, stable flow goes over mountains, uh, this releases pro the propagation of gravity waves which propagate upwards, but where the waves encounter unstable layers, the waves break and where they break with these layers, uh, and a drag is imparted on the mean flow. <clears throat> so these drag parameterizations are representing these processes on topography that is exists below the resolution of your model. Um, these two uh, on the left, the large scale models are the, the parameterization of Kim and Doyle, and they've been uh, in the RAP, Warf, the WARF ARW, and uh, we basically turned the scheme on in the latest version of the RAP and the HER. Uh, two new processes, two new schemes that we've introduced are small scale horizontal processes, which can uh, be active down to about a kilometer, the grid scale. Um, the first one is the small scale gravity wave drag scheme of Siringakas et al. 2017. Uh, it's mainly active during the night time stable boundary layers. Uh, and they, uh, ex it, where gravity waves are excited in the stable boundary layer and they break or are absorbed just above the boundary layer. So this mainly uh, is affects the lowest layers of the model. Uh, the other scheme we implemented is from Belliars et al. 2004, which is a turbulent uh, form drag so the turbulence affects uh, the pressure drag so that it's in coherent with the slope of the uh, slope of the lo lower topography. And uh, in the past, we, in areas of topography, the in the prime, the drag scheme, the PBL scheme, we've enhanced uh, the roughness factor Z naught to account for topography. With this new turbulent form drag, we can back off on Z naught <clears throat> um, and allow the form drag to sort of, to take over. So comparison of the, the relative forces of each of these uh, drag schemes for a 13 kilometer wrap uh, is shown in this slide. Uh, this is looking at the drag forces over Western Colorado and the Rocky Mountains on um, a simulation on September 19th, 2017, showing a snapshot uh, during local morning um, where all four drag 
uh, components are active and along the x-axis is the drag meters per second squared um, and it's plotted on a logarithmic axis, uh, axis. Um, and the vertical is the model level. So we start with the blue curve, which is blocking. These obviously uh, act only in the lowest, about five levels or so, uh, followed by the small scale gravity wave drag, the orange scheme. Um, they are comparable uh, in drag force. Uh, and then followed by the uh, form drag, which acts a little bit higher, up to about two kilometers or so before it tapers off to very small numbers. And then the, four, the large scale gravity wave drag, the green curve, uh, and parts of drag all throughout the troposphere and up into the stratosphere. In the afternoon, uh, you have a, a unstable boundary layer, so there's no uh, small scale drag forces imparted. The scheme is not active, and the blocking is a lot lower because it flows more likely to go over the mountains in unstable layers. So, in the we recently, uh, uh, James Canyon recently ran. Uh, reforecast tests uh, in the 13 kilometer wrap um, over a period from 2 February 2nd to the 15th, 2019. These are 27 hour forecast win winds, uh, looking at the profile over the wrap, full wrap or North America domain. Two minutes, two uh, minutes. Okay, RMSC on the left, bias on the right. <clears throat> he did, uh, we did a whole bunch of sensitivity experiments of all the different combinations of the drag schemes, but uh, I won't go over all the details, but if we just focus on the control case with the drag suite implemented and versus uh, the, the no drags, this runs with the no drag suite, we see that the RMSC is improved by about a quarter of a meter per second throughout the, the uh, depth of the atmosphere. Also, we see an improvement uh, with the wind speed, uh, with the wind bias. Uh, in the FD3 GFS, where we've implemented uh, the, the scheme, uh, we see similar improvements in the, both the RMSC and, and the BIAS. Um, the BIAS is improved quite a bit below 650 hectopascals. Above it, there's a slight degradation, but not quite as much as what we gained in, in the lower um, portion of the atmosphere. So uh, switching back and forth, so we see that the, in the uh, as implements in the FE3 GFS, we're seeing good benefits from the, from the drag suite. Uh, surface winds, uh, we, uh, time series, again we see with no drag suite, our RM, RMSEs are worse than with the drag suite turned on, and uh, same with the wind speed bias, and we see similar results with the implementation in the global FE3 TFS at the uh, comparable grid spacing, I should mention, the C768 grid, which is uh, average about 13 kilometer grid spacing. So accessing uh, the, the code and what's ahead, the GSL drag suite is now available on uh, the repos these repositories, <clears throat> the NOAA GSD and the NCAR and the GSD develop and master and DTC branches. In the CCP suite definition file to turn our drag suite on, you include this, uh, this line, drag underscore suite. Uh, static files containing the statistics of the subgrid topography, such as the standard deviation of the subgrid topographic height, are needed. Um, so for now, we have custom-made grids for the grids that are, typ that are typically used, C76, C96, as well as uh, the regional Rufus uh, three-kilometer grids. But we're planning to make it um, these grids be automatically generated on the workflow initialization. Uh, you'll need a nameless option, gravity wave dragged off equals three to activate the scheme. And soon to come, uh, we are going to merge, we're mer in the process of merging the GSL drag suite with the unified gravity wave physics uh, that uh, Valerie Uden mentioned in his talks back on Monday. And uh, these are references to the uh, drag suites that we use and um, drag schemes that we use in the suite. And that's about it. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, do, uh, yeah, do, uh, 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 do you uh, have, uh, any, do you have any, any questions? Questions on Slack? Yes, we do have a yes, question. We do have a ah. Okay, thanks for muting. All right, so one question is from um, YJ, and the question is, to what scale is turbulent form drag applied? 
Yeah, well, form drag can be applied at the coarsest grid grid scales down to about uh, about three kilometers, one kilometer. Uh, when the 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 topography is filtered uh, above about uh, the ten to twenty kilometers, so um, so no large scale topographic features above twenty kilometers are included in the calculation of the standard deviation. So physically up to about 20 kilometers, 10 kilometers, down to about the kilometer scale. So is it kind of similar to the scale for block, blocking drag? You can read my comment later. Yeah, yeah. I think we need to, yeah, move ahead. Let's go to the next uh, presentation. Is um, Benjamin Johnson talk about the development of the CRTM in support of UFS application? Right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen now. You should see my slides now. Do you see the title slide? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about what the Community Radio Transfer Model, the CRTM um, project has been working on. Um, I'm Ben Johnson, I'm the project lead for the CRTM. Um, a couple of teammates, Patrick Stegman and Chung Dong, who are also based in the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation. Um, the CRTM project's been around for at least um, about 18 years now um, with a long history. And I'll just describe briefly what the CRTM is about and what we're trying to accomplish for the near future in terms of supporting not only the UFS, but also uh, data simulation initiatives in general, and then also post-processing. But 10 minutes is not enough to do justice to anything, so I'll just give you a brief highlights and I can take questions offline. So the CRTM is really a community model. Um, we take inputs from multiple federal agencies, and those are listed here in this circle. Um, so we take those inputs as requirements, but we also provide feedback for uh, their needs as well. And I often work with these agencies to help them integrate CRTM upgrade to the latest version, um, make sure that they're running it at their optimal uh, requirements. Um, so, you know, it's a community model. Uh, it's developed in modern Fortran, so 2003 plus, let's say, it uses object-oriented code. We're constantly updating and optimizing that. We also have education and outreach elements, particularly uh, the user developer workshop, which occurs every about two years. Sorry, that slot's still available, obviously not true. Um, brought this from an older slide, but the, the whole concept of this workshop is to provide tutorials on how to run and use the RTM. Um, we also hold code sprints, which are very dedicated uh, activities to coding a particular part of CRTM. And there's a number of other things there. So the jcsda.org website contains more information about the CRTM and other projects within the Joint Center. So CRTM itself, it's a fast uh, radio transfer model. And what makes it fast is we use lookup tables um, to do a lot of the backend calculations. So um, it's, it's not pure radio transfer in all elements, but there are, it is a complete radio transfer model if you want it to be. Um, so the fast component just comes through this lookup table, like I mentioned. Uh, right now, CRTM version 2.3.0 uh, is the current release. Uh, that covers visible near IR, uh, IR, submillimeter, and microwave radiances. Uh, the color coding here indicates the degree to which these are implemented in the newest version, which is CRTM version 3. Um, so we'll be covering UV um, and farther into the submillimeter for CRTM 3. I'll give you more details shortly. So I just want to briefly touch on some of the items that we've been working on. Um, as a Version, CRTM version 3 is the next release. It'll conclude full polarization um, support. That's a full Stokes vector. So that means a lot of work on our side. The current CRTM 2.3 is just a scalar. Uh, I'll give you some ideas why we might want to do that. And there's several other models listed here that I'll just touch on briefly. Um, just to give you a motivation, here's um, this is a JEDI product for the FB3 GFS model. Um, CRTM simulations. What it's showing is the MetOp B uh, MHS. O minus B at 157 gigahertz. So it's going to be sensitive to clouds and, and snow. And what you see here is a pretty significant range of biases um, from 15 to minus 15 Kelvin on this scale. It's probably more than that. And you'll see in particular there's biases over land, ocean. Um, and a lot of this is associated to our lack of ability to accurately calculate cloud properties. And uh, with a lot of models going towards them, 
all sky, all weather uh, data simulation and modeling that we think this is a fruitful effort. So just an example of where these things match up with a Veer's image, you'll see that there's definitely, a, we're missing spots where there's obviously clouds and probably precipitation, but we're also missing areas over land as well in the Sahara. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done just on the physics. Uh, just another example of the ABI radiances here. I don't have time to go into detail, but just to show that we can do VIS, we can do IR um, across a, a wide range of radiances. So CRTM version three is the next iteration. This is currently under development. Uh, I mentioned it's gonna cover all four Stokes polarizations, so linear polarization and also the circular polarization. Um, the reason for this is because we need to support UV instruments that require polarization, but there's also uh, clouds that um, also induce polarization by scattering. So here's an example of a GPM GMI. It's a microwave imager at 166 gigahertz. And what this is showing is any pixel that had rainfall in it above one millimeter per hour, what's the polarization difference between the vertical channel and the horizontal channel? So this is all polarization that's induced by the, um, by the cloud scattering itself. And so you can see polarization differences of up to typically around eight to 10 Kelvin, and that's significant. If you're missing that in your modeling framework, then you're, miss you're having a bias of uh, potentially that much. And this applies to cross-track scanners as well. So the way we're trying to address this is by adding more realistic particle shapes into CRTM scattering table so we can more accurately calculate the polarization properties of realistic particles. Right now, it's for the microwave, it's only spheres, and for IR, we do have some non-spherical particles. But the focus for polarization calculations and scattering is really primarily on microwave and invisible. Two minutes. So, okay, let me just move ahead a little bit. So we use uh, we can use data from field campaigns to help accelerate our capabilities to do these modelings. Here's an example of some particle size information from an ARM campaign. Um, and the way we do this is we can map the condensed water contents like this QX here. Um, that comes out of the model. So those are just basically the total condensed water content. We can map that to a particle size distribution, which can then be used inside of CRTN. So I've implemented this with the GFDL microphysics assumptions within two different models. So we have some experience doing this already. Um, in order to be able to make these models, you have to make some assumptions. And so we have two choices. Uh, one is the modus collection five and modus collection six in order to model the, what the distribution of these shapes and masses might look like. Um, you can also use realistic simulations of particle shapes. These are all simulated images of 3D particles. You can compute the scattering properties of and use those. And similarly, just like we do for cloud particles, we can do this for aerosol particles as well. So we've been also experimenting with um, non-spherical dust particle shapes, uh, but always all of this starts at the end, dielectric constant, which is the fundamental basis of ready to transfer what the dielectric constant material is. And that determines how it's going to interact with the radiation in terms of emission and scattering. Another element of this is the space-based uh, radar and LIDAR capability in CRTM. So we have a Ford operator for radar and LIDAR to be able to directly assimilate radar and LIDAR um, observe observations rather than trying to assimilate products. Um, that's a new feature. Hasn't been extensively tested, but there's still some details that need to be addressed. And uh, so I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what we're doing. And I've listed some more items here that could give you additional information. Feel free to contact me directly at that email and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions, provide more details on what I've discussed. Thank you, Benjamin and uh, uh, Catherine, do you have any questions? I'm not seeing anything right now on the Slack channel. Okay, I'm monitoring that channel, so if there's questions, I can take those. Excellent, sounds good. Um, so, Man, do you want me to go ahead and, and take the next one? Yeah, thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Man Zhang, so um, I'll go ahead and introduce her. She will be speaking on improving tropical cyclone forecasting through physics advancement using the HR physics suite in NOAA's new hurricane analysis and forecast system. And Man, I'll give you a warning when you have two minutes left. Okay. Okay. Could you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Man Zhang and, uh, from DTC. The content of my talk is sponsored by uh, NOAA's Hurricanes Supplemental Project, which is a truly group effort carried out by our DTC staff dispersed at uh, two organizations. Um, Don, Mijia, and I came from GSL, 
grants, these ones, and Mike are from Inca. We also would like to acknowledge our EMC colleagues, uh, Eric, Xi, and many others for the technical support and uh, scientific discussion. In this talk, I will go over the CCPP hurricane wall physics in half and the hurricane wall physics we test plan first. The statistical evaluation was uh, calculated using MATPC developed at, uh, by DTC. The, short, the storm scale precipitation features will be demonstrated using Doran case, and a summary will be given at the end. About the host model UFS half system, the audience are welcome to refer to Avi Child's Hurricane Halves overview talk on Monday. Here's a brief overview of the two physics suites selected for the DDC physics test. The left column in the table is the Hurricane Wall physics suite based on operational Hurricane Wall version 4.0. The right column is half P0.1 physics suite based on UFS medium weather range application with hurricane specific modifications. In this table, we use the yellow highlights to indicate the aspects that differ between the suites. The new added hurricane wall physics scheme include the very illegal microphysics with separate cloud species advection, GFDL surface layers scheme, Hurricane Wolf NOAA land service scheme. We also use a generalized scale of well SARS and RTMG schemes so that the scheme can behave like either Hurricane Wolf or GFS based on the different name list options. I would not go to the great details of each scheme today, but the audience can, uh, for the CCTV detailed audience are welcome to see the uh, Dom presentation on Monday. We use two half configuration in the physics test. A is the regional and B is the global nesting. Both of them has a grid size C768 with a refinement ratio of four. Three priority storms in 2019 North Atlantic Basin hurricane season was selected for each configuration. All experiments were conducted on the Mississippi State University Orion High Performance Computing System. Neither vortex initialization nor data simulation were employed. The, the overall performance of the storm location and the intensity produced by the GFDL vortex tracker were compiled against the best track data. So H star data is a 2019 EMC house real-time results provided by EMC. All metrics were computed using the homogeneous sample. The track arrow indicated the Hurricane Wolf has less mean arrows from 48 to 90 hours than half sweet. In the mean uh, along track arrow plot, the global nesting configuration has um, almost zero bias until 84 hours before become positive. The regional configuration has higher positive bias indicating faster storms compared to observed and the global nesting con configurations. The cross track arrow indicate Hurricane Wolf Suite had comparable negative west or west bias with uh, the um, H star. The mean absolute intensity error indicates that the hurricane wall suite has lower errors compared to other or other configurations. One of the important metrics for TC verification is the storm size. The 34 north northeast quadrant wind radii errors for all configurations indicates that the half suite had the least positive bias. However, the Hurricane Wolf Suite exhibit a rather large storm size that increase with lead time. The snapshot of Hurricane Doran and the 72 hour forecast also show the excessive storm size in Hurricane Wolf Physics Suite. 
The six hour total precipitation snapshot of Doran shows that the Hurricane Wolf Suite generates more storm scale precipitation in rain bands compared to the Hubs P0.1 suite. The explicit precipitation fraction is calculated against the total precipitation at a 72 hour forecast of Doran. The reddish color in EP fraction re represents the convective rep. Uh, Precip dominates, the purple color means the explicit precipitation dominates. So uh, it also indicates that GFS scale of well thoughts and the convective precipitation in house uh, physics takes control of the whole of the rain bands. On the other hand, in the half hurricane wolf suite, very illegal microphysics take care of the whole stone, including the I war and the rain dance. Oh, um, so the main message we are trying to convey through this short talk is the uh, Harvard World Physics Suite is available in the Hubs repository. And the result of the first exercise with the uh, Harvard World Physics in Hubs are very promising. Uh, we got statics. We, we got the better mean track forecast than half suite, especially the cross track arrow in both regional and global nasty configuration. Also have improved intensive forecast compared to the half P0.1 uh, and HR. Uh, the big concern is the um, excessive size of the storms. And uh, we also noticed that the stronger uh, storm scale precipitation structure in the rain bands. Uh, needing to say uh, the additional customization and the testing in a large and a more diverse sample size is needed to realize the benefits of the suite. I think that's all I have to say. And we are happy to take questions. All right, thank you, ma'am, um, and, and well within time. So we do have um, one question right now in the Slack channel from Xu Guang Wang, and she asks, what is causing the excessive size? Uh, that's a good question. We have um, did a, a several sensitivity experiments. Uh, we have also talked to EMC scientists. There's maybe several reasons, uh, maybe because we have noticed Notice the ferro illegal scheme produced uh, a more convective scale uh, in the ram bands. Maybe the, the tracker cannot, the, the GFDL tracker cannot uh, think that's uh, exercise from the convective scale features. And then we also have tested the cloud, uh, cloud fraction and the overlap method, and that also have some sensitivity. but. That's a good question. We yes, we still need to um, hash it out. Thanks, man. I'm not seeing anything else right now. Oh, so probably move along. Okay. Um, let's go to our next. Next is uh, naming Pan from also from DTC. Okay, um, please go ahead, maybe. So, can you hear me? Yeah. So, do you see my screen? The top one? Yes, yes, the first one. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Ninian Pan from DTC Loa GSL at Ceras. I will talk about the impact of different uh, physics schemes on uh, forecasting a heat wave. Uh, the cause is listed here. So the motivation of this study is to investigate the impact of different physics schemes on the heat wave simulation. The tool used here is the UFS short range weather application. The simulation focuses on countless domain model horizontal grid space includes 25 kilometer, 13 kilometer, and uh, three kilometer. We focus on the heat wave case in the middle of July, 2019. The bottom two figures are the surface observation on July 15 and 16. The maximum temperature are in red. We can see 
it was extreme hot in the Western US. There are several stations has a temperature over 100 Fahrenheit. It spreads eastward and lasts to July 21st, 2019. So the model forecast were verified with GFS analysis, surface station observations, and uh, radio sounds using the tool MAT. There are around 3,000 surface stations and 8 radio sounds are used in the validation. So this is a physics scheme used in the experiment. There are six uh, suites, GFDI-MP, GFS V15.2, uh, V16 beta, also three uh, GSD suites. So this is a T2 12 hour forecast uh, and the bias between model and the analysis uh, for V15.2 and the V16 beta, 25 kilometer and 13 kilometer resolution, we can see the dominant patterns, similar but high resolution give more detailed, uh, detailed structures. So we verified the T2 bias uh, with the observations. Uh, the left is zero hour forecast, then 12 hour forecast for GFDLMP, GFSV 15.2 and uh, V16 beta. Uh, we can see in the Western US, you have a uh, like, uh, positive bias. In Eastern US, you have um, positive uh, lactic bias, then increase the bias when uh, at 12 hour forecast. We have some lactic bias at the Western uh, US. This is a 24 hour and a 36 hour forecast. Uh, basically, 24 hour forecast is similar pattern with the zero hour forecast. Uh, then 36 hour forecast pattern is similar to the uh, 12 hour forecast, but the magnitude they become larger. We can see it's obvious they have a uh, dynamic cycle inside. Similarly, we do the analysis for the GSD suite, uh, zero hour forecast, 12 hour forecast. Then when is GSD suite with lower land service model, the other two is with rock. We can see they have some difference. One thing needed to point out is the rock need more uh, information from the input GFS uh, in here contain a lot of provide. So they have some slight larger uh, bias, but the pattern also slightly different. Similarly, we have a 24 hour forecast and a 36 hour forecast. So the pattern uh, still is west side, you have uh, positive, then east side has negative value. Then for 36 hour, you have more positive at the central uh, yes, we can see the rock and the lower surface uh, land surface models have some uh, different impact on the T2 bias. Similarly, the, at the 12 hour and the, uh, 36 hour is similar, then zero hour and the 24 hour has similar patterns, so we can see the uh, dynamic cycle inside. So, we do the domain average uh, for the corners domain. Uh, then West US, Central US, and the East, East US. Uh, this is 25 kilometers resolution. For most of the results that have negative uh, bias, for West US, you have some positive. It's uh, have larger uh, diana cycle. For Central US, the performance of the GSD suite is very different from other suite, uh, mainly due to the rock uh, surface model. Then for the East US, uh, so the many lactic uh, temperature bias. So we also have the 13 kilometer run and the three kilometer run, then to the domain average uh, bias change, then compare with the different resolutions. So the green is a uh, three kilometer run, then red is 13 and the blue is uh, 25 kilometer. The left is for uh, GFS suite, the right for uh, GSD suite. So we can see the properties uh, uh, different between GFS suite and uh, GSD suite. When increase the resolution, the bias of surface uh, T2 
to meet the temperature become more uh, negative. The change of uh, GSD suite with the resolution is small, but the have more uh, stronger uh, diurnal cycle inside. Similar, similar, we also use the uh, soundness around the eight uh, soundness of a condensed domain. Then we compare it. This is an example of the sounding at Oakland, California. Zero hour forecast, forecast twelve hour, twenty four and thirty six. So we can see at the initial time the difference is small, then increase uh, with time slightly larger at the uh, boundary layer. So this is the domain average of uh, temperature bias for grid spacing at uh, uh, three kilometer at uh, zero hour, 12 hour forecast, 24 hour and 36 hour forecast. So it is very obvious is the 36 hour forecast, the uh, V16 beta has a strong uh, negative bias. Two minutes. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, summary, we can see T2 bias of surface station tend to have uh, positive values in the western US and the negative in the eastern. The impact of diurnal cycle is obvious. The GFS V16 beta forecast has strong cold bias at most of the eastern stations. The non-surface model can have a strong influence on the T2 bias. The bias pattern is similar for different horizontal grid resolution, however, the Magnitude increase with uh, the wrong resolution. So the one question is often asked is why V16 beta has a uh, larger code bias. So we checked the total cloud cover. We can see it has a, a larger uh, code a cloud cover in V16 beta compared with V16 uh, V15.2. This is a difference between uh, th these two schemes. Uh, the red means you have more cloud. So it, you can see the more cloud uh, in V16 beta. This is also consistent with the uh, uh, surface uh, RH. This is surface RH bias. The left is V15.2, uh, then V16 uh, beta. So uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mimi. Do uh, Catherine, do you have any questions? We do not have anything in Slack at this moment. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we can go to the next. Is Sarah Grazing? Okay. Please go ahead. How do I share my screen? Oh, I see you present now. Got it. Can you see my screen? We cannot. Could you oh, try the, <laughs> the present now button one more time? I can't click on it because it says I'm already presenting. Got to hit share again. Jeff, I don't know what you meant. Of course, it's what happened to me. <laughs> Is there a dialog box up under the window? I can also pull up yours if there's a problem. The only thing on my computer screen is my slides, so I don't know. That's my first time with Google Meet, unfortunately. All right, I'm pulling yours down right now, so we can we can drive Bria. Of course, this would happen. Well, at least we're 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 on time.
All right, can everyone see? There they are. All right, let me just quick mute my. Sorry, I don't know why that didn't work, obviously. No worries. All right, so um, this research looks at evaluating the impact of the planetary boundary layer, land surface models, and microphysics parameterization schemes on upper level cloud objects. Um, this is done using uh, by comparing simulated and observed GO16 brightness temperatures. So if we go to the next slide. So here is our model configuration. It's, um, they're based on the FV3. So we have our control simulation, which uses the Thompson microphysics schemes, the MIN PBL, and the, the GFS surface layer, and then the NOAA land surface model. And we compare the control to six different model configurations. Um, the reason why we call the control the control is we don't have any assumptions on whether the control is the better model. Um, but every single configura configuration is something slightly different from the control. So what we're calling the NP NSSL uses the NSSL microphysics. Uh, MPMG uses the Morris and Gettleman microphysics, for example. And then we tried two different PBL schemes, as well as a different surface model, uh, land surface model. And then finally, we use a different surface layer with the different land surface model. And then the figure on the right here is just an example, random time of the simulated brightness temperatures from all seven con model configurations. So we can see that there is some differences between the seven configurations. So if we go to the next slide, the methodology with this is gonna be done using the method for object-based diagnostic evaluations or mode. Um, and we're gonna split this up into two different methodologies. Um, one is gonna be the object-based analysis, which uses the object-based threat score which basically compares the interest score between matched objects multiplied by their objects over the entire uh, area, uh, multiplied by the area of the objects. Um, and then it's just normalized by the area of all the objects. The next thing that we're gonna do is a pixel-based analysis, which is our mean absolute error and mean bias error. Um, what we're gonna do though, is we're going to use these match objects to overlay um, the simulated and the observed object. So therefore we can compare the absolute error and mean bias error without having to account for displacement between the objects. So next slide, um, just a quick summary of interest scores. That's a simulator between matching forecast and observation mode objects. Um, here are the user defined weights that we used um, in, this, in this research. And we're defining all of our objects using a brightness temperature threshold of less than or equal 235 Kelvin for both the observations and the simulations. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so here's the results using the object-based threat score. And even though we weren't expecting it, control had the highest average OTS. So basically what that means is that the control setup when it came to comparing the distance between objects, the area of objects, and a couple other things, and the overall, how many um, objects were matched, it was the best model. Uh, MPMG, which uses a Morris and Gettleman microphysics, had the lowest average OTS. When we changed the surface layer uh, to the min and the land surface model to the rock, we found that it had the steepest decline in OTS by forecast hours, which meant as the forecast went along, it got worse and worse, the worst, if that makes sense. So it just had the, like the slope in the OTS over forecast hour was the steepest. Um, and this is because this model produced an increase, uh, as a forecast hour went on, it kept producing more objects and more objects, um, more so compared than compared to any other model. And so that is what drove this steep decline. Because um, obviously if you produce more objects, if those objects aren't matched, we did use clusters in this mode analysis, so therefore we could have one observation object correlated to multiple forecast objects and vice versa. But still, um, when we changed the land surface models, we found out an increasing number of objects that did not have a match. Um, and then on the bottom, we have our comparisons, the differences from the control. Um, we noticed that a lot of the parameter changes minus the 
uh, Morrison, Gettle, and microphysics schemes actually seem to have at least a neutral or even a positive bias in the OTS, at least in the beginning of the forecast hours. Um, but by the end of the forecast hours, they were worse than the control. So next slide. Um, and this is just a breakdown like I was mentioning um, earlier. We can break the OTS down into percent of object areas matched, uh, percent of forecast areas matched, which is where the, micro, the Morris and Gettleman microphysics schemes had much, a much higher number of objects. That therefore, they had less percent of the forecast area match, which you can see on this dotted dashed blue line. Um, it's much lower than everything else. And then our average interest scores. So interest scores were fairly clustered. Um, the Morrison Gettleman microphysics scheme, though, was a bit lower compared to everything else. Next slide. So our pixel based analysis, like I said, we're going to match objects um, using a centering or we're going to center objects using an uh, approach seen in this image here, where we have our two objects. If we low overlay them like we do in figure B, there's displacement. So we're going to center them um, to what we see in figure C. Next slide. And what we see when we do this is that control, in addition to having the lowest OTS, also had the lowest mean absolute error, which means that it is uh, considered the most accurate. Uh, and the, when we use a Morrison Gettleman microphysics scheme, uh, that had the lowest mean absolute error and it also had the lowest mean bias error. The brightness temperatures were much colder than the control, which was, the be which was considered the best. Um, interesting as we switched the microphysics schemes to the NSSL scheme, it had the warmest brightness temperatures. We had a positive mean bias error compared to the um, observations. And then updating the PBL schemes, um, they did end up resulting in less accurate brightness temperatures, but um, the brightness temperatures were more neutral, or the air, the, excuse me, the bias and the brightness temperatures were more neutral. So next slide. Next thing we wanted to do was just wanted to look at this brightness temperature bias. So this is a cumulative distribution function over all the pixels in our data set. And we got the six and a half percentile because that was our observations of 235 Kelvin and found that for each uh, model configuration and then ran the same analysis again. And I have two minutes. <laughs> uh, so next slide. Um, this is just the comparison. We compared when we used the straight 235 Kelvin compared to the ones where we used the uh, six and a half percentile. And we can see that while the OTS is better, the results were still the same. Uh, the Morrison Gettleman still had the lowest OTS, control still had the highest OTS, and the order of accuracy for the configuration didn't really change, except for NSSL microphysics dropped from second to fourth. So next slide. So in conclusions, um, when we changed the microphysics scheme, we noticed that the Morrison Gettleman resulted in lower brightness temperatures which were less accurate, and the NSSL microphysics resulted in higher brightness temperatures. Changing the PBL scheme reduced the high brightness temperature bias. Uh, the control had a slightly positive mean bias error. Changing the PBLs did bring that mean bias error down to something closer to zero, though based on the mean absolute error, they were still less accurate. Um, updating to the surface um, also reduced the accuracy of the simulated brightness temperatures. Um, they, they, were, they either were too low or high, and probably the most interesting is when we accounted for the model bias in the OTS, we would expect to have smaller objects. Um, it didn't impact the relative performance of each model configuration compared to each other. So with that, um, if there's time for any questions, I'll always thank you for bringing up my slides because I don't know what happened there. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, all right, let me hop over. It looks like the Slack channel is quiet, so. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, we have the last talk. He's from Jianwen Bao. Okay, uh, go, go ahead. Okay, greetings, everyone. I take uh, you all can hear me well. Yeah, uh, we can see you 
Yeah, that's good. Good. I'm uh, wearing my uh, EMC hat to present a plan that Vijay Talabargada, Jack King, George Grell, Jim Doyle, and I put together to reinvigorate the activities of the UFS Physics Working Group to address NOAA's operational needs. The plan was motivated uh, by the observations we had um, in the past. That is, as individual researchers and uh, exper experts of physics, uh, we are all entitled to have our free will to explore what's best to resolve the existing problems in the operational components of the UFS. We have, we have observed that there is a, a gap now between what collectively we think the best we can resolve the problem in the operational components of the UFS and actually what are going to work effectively and needed by the NOAA's operation. So we came up with this plan so that it can help to uh, revitalize the activities of the entire physics working group to address NOAA's operational needs. So in the plan, we maintain that, that the uh, main charge to the physics working group is uh, it's the same, that is to help develop the physics parameterizations in a couple of UFS with advanced ideas and techniques. There are two detailed two stream objectives included in the plan to help meet um, what I said that the field gap um, I just mentioned. The uh, objectives uh, of the two streams include the short term objectives that is to diagnose major deficiencies in the GFS 16 physics suite and to provide an incremental update and improvement to the model physics suite, which is more advanced, involving better ideas and the techniques to target for the implementation in the GFS V17. The plan includes long, a long-term objective that is to eventually deliver an advanced physics suite through an overhaul development that will be implemented in the GFS components of the couple of the UFS beyond the GFS V17. So we provide a strategy for engagement and coordination to fill the gap I mentioned. So we needed to set up a two tier task teams. The first task team is made of the developers, diagnostic experts and the subject matter experts to target uh, to tackle the issues in the existing physics suite of the GFS V16. Then we're gonna uh, set up a broader NOAA-led task team uh, by expanding the smaller task team I just mentioned, which consists of a task, sub-task team headed by lead experts of individual parameterization components in the entire coupled UFS. Specific charge to the first task team include mitigating the major deficiencies of the GFS V16 physics suite through physical process diagnosis. Then we will carry out an increment improvement based on the findings from the aforementioned diagnosis. Then we further develop the scheme and, uh, and not just scheme, just the whole entire physics suite to better represent fluxes at the interface of the UFS component models, targeting the coupled reanalysis and reforecast project for GFS V17 and the GFS V13. Those are planned to begin, uh, become operational in physical year 2022. For the long-term objective, uh, it includes general tasks those tasks include, um, first of all, we have to develop a, a, a team, right? After the team is, is established, we're gonna work on to get issues that we identified based on the scientific and technical insight obtained by the first task team. Then we're gonna work together to develop other components of the master suite with advanced ideas and technology to complement and to, Space integrate with the new macrophysics scheme 
and other most uh, physics schemes that we put together for GFSV-17. All of this is going to be targeted for the implementation in the coupled UFS beyond GFSV-17 and the GFSV-13. All of this is for the purpose of harnessing community support by a close task coordination across the UFS deterministic and the stochastic physics development teams. There are additional charts in this plan uh, for the physics working group. They include providing guidance for the development of physics for the uh, high resolution and the regional applications of UFS, including short range and canon hurricane applications. All of these high resolution uh, models requires the physics development to be more specific for severe weather conditions. Then we're gonna uh, form a selected team of scientists to target these regional and high resolution applications and to work together with the rest of teams to accomplish all the tasks across the scheme, uh, scale of applications of UFS. So this particular high resolution physics task team, okay, will draw from what I just mentioned, the previous two global physics task teams. So the overarching final delivery will be a unified physics suite applicable across various temporal and the spatial time scale, uh, spatial scales of medium range, sub seasonal to seasonal, uh, regional and the hurricane forecast applications. So in this plan, we can uh, uh, have, uh, according to this plan, we're gonna have more meetings than what we used to have. This working group had, has been there for a long time, if you all aware of this uh, since last summer but we have not met as often as needed. Now we think that we need to meet more often, at least once a month. We also uh, work together to select task teams with the specific goals as the research and the development task goal. We'll continue interacting with other projects, particularly those um, projects under Hurricane Supplemental and the UFS R2O to uh, work together and coordinate effort across the UFS community. We're gonna use specific uh, uh, project management tools like conference or smart sheet, whatever gonna be designated for the UFS project management uh, to coordinate uh, the interaction and the communications between the teams. The physics working group will also provide guidance to cross-cutting application teams and other working groups of UFS related to the physics developments. That's all for the plan. I look forward to questions if there is time. Thank you, Wow, uh, Catherine, do you have any questions? We do. Um, so there's a question from Evan Kalina. How can, how can community members get involved in the physics activities of the physics working group? Will some of the meetings be open to interested members? Yes, I think the best way for people to move forward is to talk to the co-authors of the plan I just presented. If you noticed that I've not said anything about who are going to serve as co-chairs of the working group and who will be the members of this physical working group. Those will be announced by uh, UFS management team about me in the very near future. Okay, so we have another question. Um, thanks, Bao. So uh, this one's from Lija Bernadette. Um, she says, Bao, today we had many we have many parameterizations being worked on. What would be the process to narrow down to a common suite for all applications? Well. <laughs> I think, uh, Ligia, thanks for the question. Um, I think that the best way for us is to uh, communicate more frequently and closely, okay? I think uh, if we follow this plan, uh, I think uh, to meet NOAA's operational need is the best point for us to work together to narrow down what's needed. After all, the overarching objective of UFS 
is to provide the best forecast for the nation. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think, um, yeah, let's, I think we are doing really great and uh, get more time to stretch our legs before next meeting. So okay. man, there was one additional question if you want, okay. to, yeah. you want me to speak to that one. Okay, so the one that just came in was from Lisa Benningson. And she said, thanks Bao. This working group plan is almost exactly as what is listed in the UFS r o physics sub project. How does this fit in? Well, that's exactly the purpose to have this plan. I mean, this plan is uh, entirely derived from the UFS R2 project. And you can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the essence of the motivation behind the plan is to make everyone try for us to work uh, together to meet short-term needs of NOAA's operation, as well as long-term need for the UFS development. 